Good morning. It's a delight to take part in this online conference on libraries, archives, and public life. This year I'm on leave from the University of Toronto, and I'm privileged to be splitting my time between a visiting professorial appointment in the School of Information Sciences and Technology at Athens University of Economics and Business and Hattie at the University of Glasgow. Today I'm going to talk about Beyond Place, Data Curation Possibilities for Post-Custodial Archives and Libraries. What I propose doing for the next 30 minutes or so is to look back and reflect and then look forward to what a post-custodial archival landscape might resemble and how we might make it work. To do this requires we think about what archives are, and we reflect, reflect on how we create, document, communicate, access, and use information. One of the best ways to think about what archives are is to reflect on a biblical story. The book of Ezra records that when Tethani, governor of Trans-Euphrates, wished to verify whether there was historical authority to the claim of the Jewish elders that Darius' predecessor Cyrus had authorized the rebuilding of the temple at Jerusalem, he wrote to Darius asking, quote, now, if it pleases the king, let a search be made in the royal archives of Babylon to see if King Cyrus did in fact issue a decree to rebuild this house of God in Jerusalem. Then let the king send us his decision in this matter. The Persian king ordered a search of the archives. A document was found in the citadel at Ekbatana in the province of Media, demonstrating what the Jewish elders had claimed was true, was so. The story tells us many things about ancient archives. For example, documents were collected and stored in centralized places. There were many royal archives. Ekbatana, where this particular record was found, was just one such site. The particular document was held at one archive and not replicated in many. The king and his satraps were confident the royal archives were trusted repositories of records. Even those in adversarial relationship to the king and his satraps trusted the way records were managed. The archives were structured in ways that made it possible to find records. They were organized, probably documented, and evidently accessible, even if only by royal decree. When you compare this story to current discussions about trusted repositories, we can see that little has changed in the past two and a half millennia. We also see the emphasis on place for storage as a core theme. Even if in the rush towards cloud computing, we do not really have a secure sense of where exactly that place is, we still have an impression that the repository is storing the stuff somewhere. When we consider the 10 characteristics of repositories as defined by the Center for Research Libraries, the Digital Curation Center in the UK, and Digital Preservation Europe, the archives of Darius can form as readily to these properties as do the repositories at any contemporary national library, archives, or data center. As has been noted by many, the cultural and heritage information held in and destined to be accessioned by our memory institutions provides a source of raw materials for intellectual, social, cultural, and economic prosperity in the century to come. The value of these raw materials multiplies when they're available in digital form, and when materials from diverse sources, such as film, audio, documents, artifacts, performances, data, works of art, and much more can be explored in tandem. As scholars, students, and the general public, armed with algorithms and increasingly sophisticated software, explore this burgeoning content, they will find new ways to make discoveries and tell new kinds of stories about the past, the present, and our future. Cultural heritage resources in digital form can, as is widely recognized, serve as a sustainable and renewable resource to be exploited in ever-increasing diversity of ways. In the digital guise, these materials provide core resources for enabling education, supporting lifelong learning, underpinning the development of new products by creative industries, contributing to the improvement of the quality of life through their analysis and through their virtual accessibility, providing information about places 
that will help to foster tourism. But we are not creating digital objects in the same way that we used to. And this is changing the way archives come to acquire them. This year is the 24th anniversary of the publication by Avram Mickelson and Jeff Rothenberg of what I consider to be a truly classic article. Scholarly communication and information technology, exploring the impact of changes in research process of archives, is an article that has really come of age. Too often our emphasis on currency leads us to pri privilege recent literature, and we often fail to look back Writing before the web was more than a glimmer at CERN, they identified, quote, end user computing and connectivity, end quote, as having a transformative effect on the entire process of scholarly endeavor. They argued that end user computing, quote, enhances the autonomy of researchers, end quote, and connectivity, quote, enhances researchers' ability to access data, collaborate, seek input, and disseminate ideas and results, end quote. They proposed a five-stage model for scholarly communication, which has received little of the airplay it deserves. But, for us, it is their discussion of archives that is really of interest today. They stress the need to make archival sources available on the net, the need to document network-mediated scholarship, and, quote, the development of archives designed to operate on global networks, end quote. They went on to argue that the future of the archival mission in relation to electronic communication is being defined by a set of agents wholly separate from the work of the traditional archival profession. In the intervening years, archives have pushed back and demonstrated their centrality to the scholarly enterprise, their capacity to develop digital repositories and to ingest and manage digital materials. But developments such as the emergence of private data owning companies, genealogy firms such as Ancestry.com are again disrupting this practice. That said, technological advances are making new ways of thinking about archives possible, just as they're making new ways of creating digital information possible. I aim to explore a few of these today. Mickelson and Rothenberg did not imagine the rise of the web, let alone blogs and social media. But they did recognize the challenges of managing digital stuff, an activity we now refer to as digital curation. What is the objective of digital curation? Perhaps you may agree that in digital curation we aim to ensure the long-term viability of the semantic meaning of a digital object and its content. We seek to sustain its provenance and authenticity to maintain its interrelatedness, that's the interlinking between digital objects, and to secure information about context of its creation and use. An appreciation of the characteristics, functions, and behaviors of digital objects is essential, measured planning necessary, and the recognition that digital curation and preservation is a risk management activity at all stages of the longevity pathway critical, as I've explained in an earlier article. In taking preservation planning in action, individuals and organizations must adopt a level of risk that reflects their curation objectives and capabilities of both organization and technology. Our approach to curation must be variable and digital object responsive. Each future rendition of a digital object must carry the same force as the initial instantiation had. Quote, every instantiation is a performance representing a range of functions and behaviors. We need ways to assess the verisimilitude of each subsequent performance to the initial one and clear definitions of acceptable variance from the initial instantiation will be needed. End quote. Uh, quotes that I don't um, cite someone for from earlier work of my own. While some might argue that research in the area of digital curation has been innovative, in reality it has been far from sufficient to underpin the growing need for curation services. To address the increasing complexity underlying interrelatedness of digital entities and the challenges to preservation of authenticity, integrity, and provenance of digital entities across time. 
as I've argued as elsewhere during the last 20 years, members of the archives, library, records management, and research communities have amplified the risks associated with not preserving our digital heritage and generated an agitating buzz about digital preservation. I had thought we'd shouted about the issue sufficiently, but I continue to be surprised at how much more shouting we are going to need to do. We need to know that our memory institutions are not just working and building capacity to handle digital materials if they are deposited, but we need to be assured that they are actively working to ensure that the creators of digital entities are securing the material with the intention to deliver it to, to archives and libraries. After nearly 30 years of debate about digital curation and preservation, we find that little secure progress has been made. While what I'm going to say is perhaps true of many, if not all nations that rely on digital systems to manage their government records, the following example comes from the United Kingdom. BBC reporter Phil Tinline, on the 21st of March 2016, under the banner Too Good to Be Forgotten, Why Institutional Memory Matters, drew attention to a report by Sir Alex Allen from August 20. 14, which found what many of us who took part in the 1993 British Library British Academy workshop on electronic information resources and historians predicted would happen. Quote, almost all departments have a mass of digital data stored on shared drives that is poorly organized and indexed. End quote. As a result, the transfer of records to the National Archives is not happening at the scale in which it should. Moreover, Sir Alex found that most of the focus is on text documents and emails, but I should note that records can encompass a wide range of formats, some of which are complex and not easily stored even in newer systems." End quote. From a slightly longer perspective, Professor Kennedyne, who was involved in the release of the government records in 2009 following 30 years of closure, reported that where material presumably had been created digitally, there was nothing there. So, we need more activism to ensure that government records are secured and transferred to institutions for long-term use and access. But once they arrive, what happens? The current generation of solutions, many of which center on migration and emulation, are unrealistic and focus too heavily on narrow aspects of the problem. They are the kinds of solutions that like the recovery of the doomsday disk by Paul Wheatley and his colleagues, as impressive as their work was, are best described as artisan initiatives. They will not scale. Processes from appraisal and selection to ingest to description to management must be automated, capable of authentication and be continuous and dynamic. The processes must be scalable so that small and large institutions can contribute to the overall preservation agenda. In other words, our approaches require a radical change. We need some new ways of thinking about digital curation and to come at the challenge with some new disciplinary perspectives. Michelson and Rothenberg predicted in 1992 that the expansion of online bibliographic access would make scholars more productive and literature more accessible. But as visionary as they were at the time, they did not envisage the real potential. Simply, our documentary heritage in, in libraries and archives is a tremendous cultural significance. And how we study and the public uses it continues to benefit from more and more creative approaches and new kinds of technologies. Accessible bibliographic materials, for instance, not only make scholars more productive, but they've opened doors to new ways of examining the cultural heritage that have produced new kinds of knowledge. Among these is the work of a University of Toronto professor, Michelle Axelpoulos, who in an article five years ago in the American Economic Review showed how by mining mark records of technology books, she could offer economists a new indicator of technological change which she was able to demonstrate was not laden with the deficiencies inherent in more traditional indicators used by economists, such as patents. In fact, the relationships between, quote, economic fluctuations in the post-World War II period, end quote, could be predicted, she demonstrated, by studying the titles and subjects of books in, U 
in the U.S. libraries before World War II. Libraries, and in particular scholarly libraries, are at a critical juncture. The number of monographs published each year continues to grow, but the growth is glacial in comparison to the rise in gray literature and new kinds of media such as film, video, audio, animations, to name just a few, that are released in digital form. How are our memory institutions to cope with the search? Beginning in the 1960s, libraries began to benefit from initiatives to share cataloging records for books and serials. To this day, libraries continue to reap rewards from shared cataloging. But the rise of online publications has produced an unprecedented weight of materials. How should our memory institutions select from these materials? And when they choose items to accession, how should they catalog them? Original cataloging is rarely done these days in libraries as most records are purchased from institutions such as OCLC or provided by publishers. The deluge of digital materials poses challenges to libraries. Are they to collect them? And if they do, how will they create the records that support their discovery? Automation is perhaps the main answer, but it has challenges. If libraries are going to ingest great literature and digital materials on any meaningful scale, they need tools to automate genre identification, metadata extraction, and delineation of subject classification. Then there is, of course, the problem of new kinds of media, which needs to be described in accessions. Among these, databases are entities which pose unrelentingly persistent problems. Databases lie at the heart of contemporary society and their long-term preservation is essential if we are to provide future researchers, whether scholars or genealogists, with sufficient information to understand ourselves and indeed themselves. But <clears throat> the research in appraising, accessioning, and managing the preservation of databases remains in its infancy and there are few tools currently available to support the processes. Another persistent challenge is that digital libraries and repositories handle collections of digital objects as opposed to discrete entities. It is the integrated nature of these collections that provides some degree of complexity to the individual objects and therefore make it possible for us to understand their semantic meaning. However, moreover, collections often only gain real value when they are integrated with collections held by other repositories. The research that has been done into interoperability across generations of systems, time, and repositories has been insufficient. There are exceptions, such as the work on provenance and databases by Peter Booneman at the University of Edinburgh. The sheer quantity of digital objects with which digital libraries need to deal means that we need to do more in terms of automation of processes than we've done in the past. Areas where automation has promise include metadata extraction, preservation planning and action, and selection and appraisal. To date, the tools that support automation of processes are quite limited and require human intervention at most stages and do not scale. Again, we have just not done the underlying research, experimentation, and testing. My University of Glasgow colleague, Dr. Yunyong Kim, has conducted some groundbreaking work in automation, identification, and classification of documents by genre. The reason why this work is so significant to memory institutions is that once the question of automating genre classification is cracked, extracting metadata automatically from documents is relatively straightforward, as many initiatives have shown. One class of metadata, which proves difficult to extract from documents and other digital objects themselves, and can only be extracted from the environment, is contextual metadata. For instance, when using a digital object, we often need to know such information as how was the object created, how was it used, what was the legal or social context that determined its value, what kind of processes are necessary to construct 
context and meaning. What objects does it relate to? Whether its interpretation requires it to be analyzed in relationship with other objects is another issue that can only come from context. Current generations of technology are by and large designed to produce digital entities, such as those represented by image, text, data files, audio, that are inert and can only be made functional by external action, such as when they are performed by a piece of software, a notion that comes from the National Archives of Australia. Some excellent work they did. This means <clears throat> that each individual entity or group of entities requires personalized and handcraft care if they are to be preserved. In response to this challenge a decade ago, the Dulles NSF Working Group on Digital Archiving, which I had the privilege to co-chair with Professor Margaret Hedstrom of the University of Michigan, identified the need for self-aware or self-contextualizing digital objects that would, quote, know things about themselves, end quote. For example, they might know what size they are, know who created them, know where they are, know what other digital objects they are closely related to. They would also be designed to acquire information about objects in the same directory or, quote, other virtual space, end quote, and have capacity to use that information to reason about their contextual status that is to wonder, quote, do other objects share the same format, end quote, or has the similar formatted objects types been changed into newer formats? They would be cognizant as to where their metadata were and how to use them. They would know how often they had been backed up, indeed whether they were the original object or a backup copy. Context-aware digital entities would be able to observe the state of other entities and assess whether they were at risk of loss due to not being able to access transformation services. These objects would know where they are and where their metadata are. These objects would have the functionality to communicate with their originator or manager, whether it be a person or a machine, if they needed to be, for example, rescued, migrated, or secured. Ideally, they'd have the capacity to seek out appropriate services that would enable them to utilize self-archiving strategies. They might be aware of the software, representation information, and format repositories and registries to which they would need to be able to, to connect if they were to self-preserve. I know that there's a little bit of anthropomorphizing in um, this, this discussion of these, these uh, digital self-describing digital objects, self-aware digital objects, but um, we're still in the early stages of defining a terminology for them. Some of the kinds of properties that we would want to see in context-aware digital entities are exploited by the current generation of spyware technologies, ET-like phone home technologies. Other classes of agent technologies also extend the possibilities of self-aware digital objects. When combine, combined with registry technologies, and services and open software repositories, self-awareness in digital objects has the potential to provide digital entities with the capabilities of being semi-autonomous and self-managing, rather than being as they currently are, passive and dependent on repository management. These objects, the metadata object and the digital entity itself, they do not necessarily need to be tightly bound. The metadata would be a digital object itself, and it would only need to communicate with a digital object about which it was the metadata, and vice versa. At the same time, one digital object might well share some of its metadata with other objects of the same class. The degree of stickiness between metadata objects and the digital objects they characterize could vary much, just as it might vary between digital objects themselves. For instance, a digital object composed of other digital objects, such as a document with embedded images and tables, might have a high degree of stickiness, whereas a collection of related, but not interdependent digital objects, such as my 2015 photograph collection, might have lesser stickiness coefficient, as only the fact that they were photographs taken by me in 2015 binds them as a collection. Of 
course, once you have context-aware digital objects, then you can begin to imagine all sorts of things. The current approaches to ensuring authenticity of digital objects over time is to put the trust creating processes and mechanisms in repositories that are managing the objects. But what about turning the challenge around and embedding the trust mechanism within the objects themselves? Perhaps we can dispense with the need for repositories, or rather the nature of ubiquitous computing and mobile everything is creating the possibility that objects will not have a specific place where they are, but that they will be reside distributed across the web as opposed to being held by archives or libraries. So as well as embedding trust mechanisms into entities, we would also make the digital entities mobile. So bear with me a moment as I consider the prospect of safe harbor seeking digital objects before I return to the technologies of trust. Imagine digital objects akin to ancient mariners who search for a secure coastal place to shelter for the night or in the face of a storm. Our self-contextualizing digital objects exist in a virtual space. That is, they have virtual place, but not necessarily a repository place. For example, they are located on machines attached to networks or are instantiated in grids. Some systems in this environment are more robust, stable, better maintained, have more than one pathway to the network or grid, are more trusted than others, are better documented, and are more frequently backed up. Our self-aware object, with any sense, will, like a good coastal sailor, seek the safest harbor at nightfall. So it strikes me that we should investigate whether it's possible to use grid and peer-to-peer -peer technologies combined with some properties of self-awareness to create digital objects that could seek out the safest harbors and could move from less secure environments to more secure ones. In some ways, this proposal has similarities with what Locke's, David Rosenberg and Vicky Wright's Lots of Copies Keep Stuff Safe approach does, but rather than having a, the systems use reputation characteristics to determine whether to trust the storage environment, the digital objects will perform the analysis themselves. One of the greatest challenges which we will face is that of being confident in the authenticity of digital objects, whether they are stored in a digital library, archival repository, or distributed. In this, the tendency has been for memory institutions to build institutional repositories to manage these ent entities, and to, as I noted above, act as the guarantor of the authenticity of the materials in their care. As our world becomes increasingly interconnected, it is clear that there may be better ways of managing digital objects, and perhaps this might be post-custodial. If the solution to digital curation were to lie in putting intelligence at the level of the object and creating safe harbor-seeking objects which manage their own integrity and, and indeed existence, we would need a mechanism to authenticate the objects. In recent years, it's increasingly evident that there are emerging technologies which can be used to create webs of trust that make it feasible to look beyond the custodial expectation that digital objects must reside in memory institutions if they are to main, have their authenticity maintained. One such technology is blockchain, which underpins Bitcoin. Whatever your opinion may be about Bitcoin, the blockchain technology has value way beyond the currency it was initially designed to secure. Blockchain technologies will revolutionize mechanisms for enabling trust and for validating it. It has the potential to reshape archival and library approaches to digital curation, just as it will change banking and many other information service dependent industries. One of the major advantages of this approach is that it takes us beyond the need to transfer records and make it possible to establish trusted distributed custodial mechanisms at the time that the objects themselves are created. Thus addressing the difficulties identified by Sir Alex Allen in his review of the UK government record keeping practices. We need to look beyond digital repositories to digital curation ecosystems. Ecosystems are much more versatile, far less static, and have the potential to have 
and inherent natural resilience. This brings me to a much more significant problem. The great focus of research, preservation modeling, and planning has focused on the digital library, digital repository, and digital archive as locus of digital object management. The fundamental model, which shapes most research, discussion, and design of approaches to curation and preservation, is OIS, Open Archival Information System. The processes are repository-centric. Certainly our notions of archives going back a millennia, as evidenced by the biblical quote with which I opened this talk, are repository-centric. They depend upon the accumulation, management, and storage of materials and archives. From a user vantage, whether public or scholarly, these become centers of mediation between the materials on which scholarship depends and other researchers who use them, a mode of communication and research which Mickelson and Rothenberg imagined would be broken down, but which instead appears to be being reinforced by emerging digital curation approaches. The current mode of operation, which involves bringing material into archives, documenting them, and managing them at discrete space and place, is without automation on a grand scale unsustainable. It is also producing an emerging information world of exclusive information zones, something which I've explored in the context of genealogical records and Ancestry.com. I'm going to leave you to consider an alternative model, archiving beyond the archive. In a post-archival environment, instead of pulling objects into repositories, we would construct approaches, models, and workflows which would leave digital objects loose on the net, like wild salmon, knowing that the objects would acquire behaviors and eventually return to their spawning grounds. These objects would be self-aware and engage in safe harbor-seeking behaviors. They would have methods that made them cognizant of their context and ensured their viability. Essentially, they would be quasi-intelligent objects that would operate in a web of trust environments. They would be self-organizing, self-relating, and self-regulating. A digital object could exist as an individual entity or as part of a single collection or many collections. There would be no central place. The archive would be alive. It, it would have no center and no edges. I suspect that if we were to explore the notion of everywhere as the archive, and digital objects exist in curation ecosystems rather than repositories, we might generate some novel approaches to curation and new ideas as to what archives and libraries are for. Although Alfred Mickelson and Jeff Rothenberg could not have imagined the trust web which the internet and blockchains would make possible, what they were correct in predicting is that in the future archives will be, quote, designed to operate on global networks, end quote, in far richer ways than merely accessing an archive or library remotely as we do with, say, Ancestry.com. They will be archives and libraries beyond place. Of course, this does create new classes of challenges, such as the difficulties with access, ownership, information literacy, and providing user support. For those of you like me, who believe that the role of the cultural heritage and its study is to evoke narrative creation and storytelling, the archive without walls, to paraphrase Mickelson and Rothenberg, also has the potential to eliminate the privileging mediation which gatekeepers of archives and data repositories impose on the content they curate. Distributing the archives on the net also makes them amenable to new kinds of experimental analysis and exploitation which will increase the creative possibilities of the cultural heritage and public engagement. This approach though raises substantial social, cultural and economic issues which need to be explored which space in this paper has not allowed me to do. Perhaps in the conversation that follows, these issues can